Now the latest from ITV News Meridian with Sangeeta Barbara and Fred Dynage. Good evening and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines here in the south. Conned out of a million in their own homes. A victim's warning over phone gangs targeting elderly and vulnerable people. Cut off, a Dorset village loses its power supply so firefighters can try and save an old thatch cottage. No backing down on academies. David Cameron says the new school system is here to stay. What will it mean for us? And Wembley in their sights as Pompey see off Wimbledon to clinch a place in the playoffs. Good evening. Elderly and vulnerable people in Dorset have been conned out of more than a million pounds in two years by phone fraud gangs. Tonight, police are warning people not to trust anyone who calls them unless they're absolutely certain who they are. Dorset has been the target of phone scams because of a high population of older people, with criminals pretending to be police officers or bank workers. Well, one pensioner who was conned out of more than £100,000 when she was targeted over a 10-day period says the scam was elaborate and convincing. Here's Martin Douse. Pat Burnham from Dorset and her sick husband were targeted by fraudsters in the last two weeks of his life. She's bitter that he spent his last days being bothered and worried by conmen who took £135,000 of the couple's money. Yes, I don't think it contributed in any way to his demise, but it was very sad that he had this worry um, over that period. And of course, I was running around like a scared cat over hospitals and what have you. Um, and of course, it, it all played into their hands. Fraudsters will commonly pretend to be bank staff or police officers investigating irregularities with an account. In Pat's case, they pretended to be both, spinning an intricate web of lies over a 10-day period. They had Pat and her husband believing they were helping police prevent a fraud, when in fact they were handing money over as part of one. When she realised they'd been duped, she felt more embarrassed than angry. Embarrassed that I could have been so stupid. I think that was my overriding thing. Yes, I'd lost a lot of money. Um, that in itself was sad. But I, w when I rang Fraudline and said what had happened, and he said, oh, yes, ma'am, it's a scam, I thought, no, 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 it can't be. I can't have been so stupid. The phone scams regularly change and the average age of a victim is 79. In the latest one doing the rounds, a bogus bank worker tells the victim they're due a new bank card or credit card and the PIN number's needed to cancel the old one. A bogus courier then calls at the house to collect the old genuine card and deliver a new fake one. It's important to note that no organisation, whether that's a bank or the police, will ever ask for any banking details over the telephone. So if anybody phones you and asks for those details, firstly, don't ever give them out. Um, if you think you have done that, uh, when you've hung up the phone, if you dial 1471 and try and obtain the, the number that the caller has called from, then that will be really useful in trying to help catch who's responsible. This type of crime is now so prevalent that the police say, unfortunately, the time's come that the default position when your phone rings is not to trust a word you hear until you know for absolute certain who you're talking to. As far as I'm concerned, sadly, I now do not trust anybody. Martin Dow, ITV News. In other news, 60 firefighters were needed to put out a thatched roof blaze in Dorset this afternoon. It's not yet known what caused the fire at the property in Alton Pancras near Dorchester. Crews had to turn off the power in the village to deal with the incident, while residents were advised to keep their windows and doors closed due to the smoke. No one was hurt. At this stage, we're carrying out fire investigation. We don't believe that the fire is suspicious. Um, so we believe it is of accidental nature and at this point we're, we will carry out a number of um, investigations to determine the actual cause. 
On day two of the junior doctor strike, hospitals across the South say they are coping well, with the number of casualty patients down as people heed advice not to make calls unless it's a real emergency. It's meant 66 operations yesterday and 54 today have been postponed in Portsmouth alone. One patient affected is 71-year-old Melvin Rudge, who's had a triple heart bypass cancelled for the second time. I mean, I blame nobody. It's just circumstances. Um, and like I say, I don't totally blame the junior doctors. I uh, have a certain amount of sympathy for what they're trying to gain. But uh, at the moment, I mean, it's not a matter of life or death, this operation. But if I don't have it, in the not too distant future, I'll have an heart attack and it could be a lot more serious then. Specialist teams have begun detailed inspections of Bournemouth East Cliff after a landslide at the weekend. The assessment will involve detailed monitoring for up to seven days. A temporary road closure is in place in part of East Overcliff Drive while the work is carried out. The cordon extends 120 metres. People who use Southern train services had some good news today. Talks about ending strike action by guards are to be held this Friday. We well, yesterday long queues and hundreds of cancelled services, 700 of them, made getting around impossible for many. Mike Pierce is at the Southern Station on the Sussex-Surrey border and has just sent us this. Yes, well, the disruption continues tonight. Uh, on some lines, of course, there are no services at all. Uh, on others, uh, a much reduced service. The good news, I suppose, is that there will be peace talks. They take place 12.30 on Friday at Southern's headquarters in London. I suppose the bad news in all of this is that both sides are saying they're sticking to their guns. Southern want guards to uh, no longer close doors on trains. They want that to be the role of the driver, and they want those guards to be more visible helping passengers. The RMT say they believe that would be unsafe and will do everything they can to try and stop what is called driver only operation. Uh, as things stand tonight though there is another strike planned that starts on the 10th of May that is Tuesday week and that will last for four days so I think the situation is we'll have to wait and see what comes out of those peace talks. In terms of the service some lines still have no service tonight that will continue. If you're on a line that was due to have no service after 6.30 this evening uh, that will now run until the end of usual service that's because the strike ended at lunchtime and guards are now returning to work. But now all eyes on those peace talks on Friday. Mike Pearce, emergency services in Dorset are involved in one of the largest ever exercising tests of their plans to respond to a major traffic accident. It's running as a live play scenario with more than 700 people taking part across three days. So what we're trying to do with an exercise uh, like this is to give emergency responders the time to practice, to work together at a really complicated scenario. There's lots of training, emergency responders are well prepared, but they don't often get the opportunity to engage in something really big and, and work with partners to resolve it and to see it through to the end. So not just the, the response to the scene, the saving life part, but all the kind of follow-up actions. You're watching ITV News Meridian, coming up. She's a daughter of one of the Beatles. They're our Olympic hopefuls. So what is their connection with Stella McCartney? And don't forget to check out our website. Go to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Call us on 0808 1010 095 or get in touch via Facebook or Twitter. There will be no backing down. That is the message from the government on plans to force every school in England to become an academy. Well, pressure has been mounting for the government to offer concessions to appease backbenchers and Tory councils angry about the plans. Today, David Cameron again told the House of Commons he would not give ground. We're going to have academies for all and it'll be in the Queen's speech. We look forward to that, but there is still time for the U-turn, which I'm sure is at the back of the Prime Minister's mind.
Well, as disquiet mounts, the school's minister, Nick Gibb, who's also the MP for Bognor Regis and Littlehampton, sat down exclusively with our social affairs correspondent, Christine Alsford, to talk about the proposals and explain why he believes making every school opt out of local authority control will raise standards. Speculation's been rife in recent days that there will be a climb down on forcing every school in the country to convert to academy status. But in an exclusive interview, the schools minister says there will be no U-turn. Are you saying no rethink, this is absolutely going to happen? Yes, I am. What we're, what we're saying is, we're of course, we're listening to, to colleagues. We'll continue to uh, consult with uh, MPs. We're continuing to consult and discuss these proposals. Or with local authorities such as Hampshire and Kent and others around the country. Um, but we are absolutely determined as a government, as we have been since 2010, to raise academic standards in our schools. But if you take an authority like Hampshire, more than 80% good and outstanding schools, if it ain't broke, why fix it? There are too many schools, even in Hampshire, uh, that are not providing the quality of education in every corner. What we want for those high-performing schools to think about how they can help the system as a whole by taking their expertise as part of a multi-academy tr trust and spreading it to those schools nearby that are underperforming. It's not about saying it isn't broken therefore don't fix it. Some schools are broken and we need the help of those high-performing schools to help us fix those schools. Critics ask where the firm evidence is that converting every school in the country is the best way to raise performance. What about schools like the John Medeski Academy in Reading, for example? Ten years of academisation, it's in special measures. Only a quarter of pupils come out with good grades. That's not exactly a great advert for academisation. No, there are some academies that have not worked. There are many local authority schools that haven't worked. But what we do, what we can do with academies that we can't do with local authority schools is we can take action very swiftly and we re-broker, we move academies from underperforming multi-academy trust to high-performing academy trust. But I can take you to Portsmouth and show you ARC Charter Academy. In 2012, fewer than half the pupils of that school gained five good GTSCs. Today, three quarters of children are gaining five good GTSCs. And I can take you to examples that are the exact opposite. I can take you to high-performing local education authority schools and I can take you to low-performing academies. Why are you treating it like it's a magic bullet and it solves every problem? Nothing's a magic bullet in education. This is part and parcel of an overall uh, range of education reforms. And it has worked. It is working in more places than not. If academy status is all about freedom, why remove a school's freedom to choose what's best for them and stay with a local authority if that's what they want? We have to have a system in this country where parents can be confident that every single local school is the best that it can be. And that's why we've given head teachers the autonomy to run their own school. And they've had that choice for five years and those that have haven't cho chosen to do it, you're now going to make them? Well, in five years we've already reached a position where 65% of academy, uh, secondary schools are, have chosen to become academies. This is a long-term plan and as a government we need to have a, a long-term plan of what will happen when we reach the point where a large number of local authorities are in a position like Bournemouth or Bromley where over 80% of their schools are academies and it's not sustainable for those local authorities to run an effective school improvement service. There's so much public concern about this. Have you been surprised? Are you listening? We're always listening and this is a white paper so of course we listen to the responses to the white paper. We'll continue to uh, consult with uh, MPs, we'll continue to consult and discuss these proposals. But there are now those that believe this white paper is increasingly unlikely to get onto the statute books in its present form. Well, Christine's with us now. Chris, this is becoming a bit of a political hot potato. I mean, what is the level of opposition from our local councils and MPs? It's pretty widespread, to be honest. The backbench Tory MPs, we have several of those in our area who are against it, and also our councils. In the past couple of weeks, we've had Hampshire come out against this. We've had Oxfordshire against this, and in the last week, West Sussex too. And parents and schools up in arms, would you say? Well, it's a difficult one for parents. I don't think there are queues of parents at the school gates demanding to know why their school hasn't become part of a multi-academy trust. But generally speaking, it's confusing for parents. This is a, a complex issue. Generally, there is concern over why we're making every school go down this route without the evidence that it's right for every school. What about the schools themselves, then? 
yes, many of them very frustrated, particularly the ones who have already raised standards. They say that there are much bigger issues to deal with, things like recruitment crisis, funding problems and exam reform. This one, as they say, is going to run and run. Christine, thanks very much indeed. Now, some ambulances dispatched after people called the NHS 111 helpline were deliberately delayed to improve overall response times. Well, that's the findings of an independent report into a secret project called Red 3 at the South East Coast Ambulance Service, which operates in East Hampshire, Sussex and Surrey. Well, the ambulance service was also heavily criticised for serious management failures, as Richard Slee now explains. Was any of this underhand work, and I do think the right word to use is underhand, was it deliberate? Those minutes of delays keep us lives. The acting chief executive of the South East Coast Ambulance Service is taking a few brickbats from West Sussex councillors. Garant Davis is in front of a scrutiny committee to explain the highly critical report which exposes how his organisation fixed the figures on ambulance response times to make it look like it was performing better than it really was. Between December 2014 and February 2015, many calls to 111 were routinely downgraded in a new covert triage system. It meant that thousands of callers were told an ambulance was on its way when in fact the call was placed in a queue, adding 10 minutes to the wait, a delay which was not recorded and so did not affect the national eight-minute target. The men responsible for the scheme are now gone and Mr Davis says that his organisation is now keen to be more accountable for its actions. Be much more open to trust, much more transparent to trust and really learn the lessons from what we did last winter, i.e. ensure we are open and transparent moving forward. Well, that transparency does not include any senior managers talking to ITV Meridian. Instead, the ambulance service has issued a 38-word statement, which includes, our staff continue to work hard to provide our patients with the high level of care they rightly expect and deserve. Was this simply a case of bad management? Governments is there in organisations like CCAM to ensure good management and there was a failure. There needs to be more communication and there needs to be more concentration in the details, including internal audit, including risk assessment. The ambulance service also revealed that disciplinary action was being taken against some staff and although it claims that no patients were harmed while the project was underway, independent investigators are still looking into that. Richard Slee, ITV News, Chichester. Time now for the sport with Southampton season ticket holder 443. <laughs> Say those magic words, Patey. Play up, Pompey. Yes, Pompey did very well. <laughs> uh, well, yes, Portsmouth fans, like Fred, are dreaming of a possible trip to Wembley. Now they've booked their place in the League Two playoffs. Last night, they travelled to AFC Wimbledon and won to secure a top seven spot. And Pompey boss Paul Cook is certainly ready to fire up his players knowing a win in the semi-finals next month would leave them that one game away from promotion. The only goal came from Gary Roberts' through ball, which saw Michael Smith score his third goal in five games. Southampton fans will be remembering their own special Wembley trip this weekend. It was May the 1st, 40 years ago, when Saints won the FA Cup, and 200,000 fans filled the streets to welcome the team back. This Sunday, many of the players and boss Laurie McMenemy will recreate that bus parade on top of the same bus, with memories of 1976 still fresh in their minds. We thought it would just take half an hour round and the biggest crowd I think ever turned out for anything at all before or since. It was absolutely incredible and even now, 40 years on, I walk into Romsey, my little local place, and uh, someone will stop they weren't necessarily at the game, but they can tell you where they were on the day after. Fantastic memory. And we'll have more fantastic memories on Friday's programme. Now, though, we are 100 days away from the Olympics. But for Weymouth sailor Luke Patience, the road to Rio hasn't been straightforward. The 2012 silver medalist was left in shock when his crew in the 470, Elliot Willis, was diagnosed with cancer. But the 29-year-old is determined he and new crew, Chris Groob, can win a medal in Elliot's name. 
Sally Simmons has sent this from Mallorca. It's not quite been the four years that I would have imagined leading up to Rio. I'm now sailing with my third crew in the cycle. I sailed with Joe Glanfield at the start and, and then more recently, obviously, tragically, Elliot's been diagnosed with bowel cancer. It was last December when the Royal Yachting Association confirmed that 32-year-old Elliot Willis had cancer. The British sailing team is a close-knit community. Most of them have known each other for years. The news of Elliot's illness has been a shock to everyone. This time four years ago, Luke Patience and his crew for 2012 Stuart Bithell were riding the crest of a wave. Nothing could shake their self-confidence and drive for success. This is our first games and we're going to the Olympics um, because of absolute passion for medals and passion for winning the Olympic Games. Four years later and Patience and new crew Chris Groob want to medal in honour of their friend Elliot. If we can pull ourselves together and they'll be at the front of the fleet like that, wow, it, it would, that would mean a lot to everything that's gone on and I, and I don't know, I hope that would, you know, I'm finishing work that me and Elliot started together. The pair were just off the podium in Palma, but they've more test regattas, more time to move up the rankings before Rio. Sally Simmons, ITV News, Mallorca. Well, our athletes may spend years preparing for the Olympics and Paralympics, but today the reality of Rio 2016 came a little closer as this year's kit was unveiled. And just like in 2012, it's been designed by Stella McCartney. From the launch, David Wood reports. They may not have all guaranteed their place yet, but they at least have the kit. It's been designed by Stella McCartney, and this is how our teams will look in Rio. And it's apparently 10% lighter than four years ago, which should enhance our athletes' performances. Really exciting to think that, you know, in 100 days' time, the Olympic Games are going to be starting, we're going to be out in Rio, and, you know, today being able to actually see the kit for the first time on everyone and seeing what it's going to look like and just how it unifies the team. I think Stella's done an amazing job with the design and she's done one better than 2012, if you could even think it was possible. The kit revolves around a newly designed coat of arms with a motto translating as conjoined in one. It was created by the College of Arms to include references to all four home nations and both the Olympic and Paralympic teams. The Olympic uh, movement is special, uh, unique in its own way, and I think the Paralympic movement increasingly is recognised as such as well. What's the same is the commitment to what it takes to win and the, being a world-class athlete. The dedication, the training, it's great that through the kit they look you know, equivalent and the same, uh, but actually we also know there's some difference in each side that should be celebrated too. And to make sure the kit is right, 2012 Olympic medalists Jess Ennis-Hill and Tom Daly have been involved in the design process for the last two years. And the team certainly look the part, but they have an immense challenge ahead of them. After such an impressive medals haul during London 2012, they want to better that this year. But they have a problem. No team has ever done better in an away games than they have in home games. As tradition dictates, the Olympic flame has been lit in Greece and as part of the torch relay, it's been run through a centre for refugees in the country. It's being handed over you, to Rio today. You, so for our athletes, time is running out and it's back to training. David Wood, ITV News. And that is your sartorially stylish sport for today. Just like yourself. You are lovely. Saints FA Cup win in 1976. Yes. What a memory. I did the commentary on that. You were there in the streets. Sangeeta was two. Two. She was <laughs> Tom. Yeah, I, know, I can't believe it because the pictures were so amazing. Yeah. But you were only four. I was only four and on the there. avenue, apparently waving. Yay! But An yes. amazing crowd. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. Will they get a good crowd on Sunday as oh, well? Oh, they will do. Saints are also playing that afternoon at St Mary's against Man City. So I think a lot of people will turn up to the Guildhall, wave everyone on. Just brilliant memories for everyone. Or yeah. they want some good weather. Let's hope they'll get it. Andrew, brilliant. thanks very much indeed. Thank Let's you. get the forecast. Amanda Houston. From blizzards to pool, driving through Europe. Eurotunnel the Shuttle sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. 
Hello again. Well, we've certainly seen some lively weather across the region today. Sunshine one minute and sharp, lively wintry showers the next. And as we go through the next few days, it is remaining unsettled out there. Further showers to come, which could be wintry in nature. Low. By the time it to the weekend, things are looking a bit better and hopefully it won't be feeling as cold out there too. Now for the rest of this evening and tonight we've still got a few showers lingering and if you do catch one of these they could be heavy and wintry in places low throughout the night they will fade away so it's going to become dry with some clear skies temperatures falling below freezing so we are expecting a widespread frost and obviously where those showers have been falling there is a risk of some ice too so all of that is going to take us into a chilly old start to the day tomorrow night will be mostly dry to begin with so with some lovely spells of sunshine but as the day goes on the cloud will increase and that may bring one or two showers low for most of us is actually going to stay dry during daylight hours bright or sunny spells the winds will be light to moderate but it's still feeling fresh we're looking at highs there of 10 or 11 degrees see you a bit later on bye bye euro tunnel the shuttle sponsors itv meridian weather In just a moment, we've got the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale and Mark Austin. Stacey Poole has got our late news, so try and join her if you can. But in the meantime, from all the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you very much indeed for watching. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.